I would like to start by thanking the first international workshop on essence in education and training for inviting me to give this talk. I would also like to say just in setting the stage for my talk that there are many possible uses of essence. Many people think of essence as a common ground to describe any method. And while that's true, and it is a powerful use of essence, I want to share with you another exciting and practical and timely use of essence that can be used to help prepare our next generation of software professionals for the challenges they are certain to face. Pekka Abramson recently observed in an Essence Education Forum meeting that what we have traditionally been teaching our future software engineers in the university is significantly, significantly different from what many practitioners experience in the real world. And he referred to the fact that we don't teach them how to build their own method. While I agree with Pekka, it occurred to me while listening to him that when the students leave the university and go into industry, most of them won't be asked to build their own method anyway. But what they will be asked to do is to learn and use the method that is used in the organization that they've chosen to work in. This could be agile, agile at scale, waterfall, but even if we were to teach these methods in the university, these students will be in for a big surprise when they go into industry. Because the fact is, in each organization, whether it be agile, agile at scale, waterfall, each of them, their implementations are different. And so the first challenge of these new students as they arrive into industry will be to learn what I like to refer to as the expected way of working. And it is equally important to know that what they'll also be asked to do is to help improve that expected way of working. So the first practical thing that I believe we should be teaching our next generation of software professionals is how to improve an existing method. A perfect example of this is the common retrospective practice that we often see in agile and agile at scale organizations. So given this, what I'd like to do in the remainder of this presentation is focus on how we can help teach our next generation of software professionals, how to improve a method using essence. And to do this, what I would like to do now is just go back and talk a little bit about the history of the development of the essence checklists, because I believe there's a real opportunity here. As I'm sure most of you who know anything about essence are aware of, Essence has seven alphas. The alphas are the most important things we work with. Each alpha has five or six states. But what I don't think gets the attention that it deserves is the list of checklist items that characterize each of those states. And that is what I wanna focus on in the remainder of this presentation. Uh, because I believe it is the checklist items that we can use to help explain and to teach our next generation of new professionals how to go about improving any method. In my own training that I have been giving to software professionals in industry going back before the development of Essence, I often encourage the participants to share their own stories 
of the challenges and solutions that they have faced on real software development projects. When we were developing the Essence checklists, I shared many of these stories with other volunteers and they shared their own stories. The Essence volunteers represented industry, academia, and research. And thus, through this, many of the stories we shared became the genesis for what today is in the Essence framework in those checklists. Now let me share with you a few of the guidelines we used in transforming those real world stories into Essence checklists. First, natural language. We didn't want to introduce any new terms. We wanted terms that software developers would already be familiar with. They're not check the box checklists. They were intentionally worded to elicit conversation. Examples of this are phrases that we intentionally put in those checklists, such as agreed to and sufficiently. People will ask, agreed to by who? The answer is teams need to talk about it to decide who is important given their context to get agreement. Sufficiently is another word that falls into that same category. What does sufficiently mean? It depends on your context. Teams need to decide. We also focused on writing checklists that were getting the team to think about the goal. This ties back into the fact that they're not check the box checklists. They require thought process. So one thing I might suggest to university professors is to create common industry situations, scenarios, and then ask your students to use the essence alphas and the checklists to first analyze the situation, then identify likely or possible root causes of problems, and then suggest improvements to resolve those problems. This is a great way to help train them and be prepared to participate in retrospectives when they go into industry. This is also a great way to teach them how to use Essence as a thinking framework. It, it, it is a critical thinking tool. I would also point out at this point that I really feel that this is very timely in the sense that in the world we're living in today, Software can be used in both positive and, and negative ways. And so software engineers need to be taught their responsibility. And now we're getting into ethical decisions. Essence is a great tool that can help in this area. I would also point out, and I put it on this slide, just this uh, weekend, I'm putting this together actually on November 7th, Saturday, right before the conference. And I was reading in Communications of the ACM, the November issue, an article called, It is Time for More Critical CS Education. I'd recommend that article. And what we're talking about here is very relevant to the topics that are, that are tied into that article. So now let me give you just a few examples of common situations that I often hear from my clients. We're always dealing with unclear requirements. I hear that all the time. We can't get our stakeholders to work with us. The hardware is always late and management ends up cutting the software test time. So how might you use the Essence alphas and checklists to dig into these problems? So I'll now just give you a few examples on how I do it with my clients. What I'm going to share with you, I've referred to in some of my publications as using Essence in stealth mode. This is an actual case study of one of my clients where I used Essence in stealth mode to help solve a problem. As you can see in bubble one, my customer starts out saying, let me explain the problem we have. Our two key customers use our system differently. So while I'm listening to him in the back of my head, when I hear the word customer and system, I'm thinking stakeholders alpha, software system alpha. Then the, my client continues in three. Often when we get focused on changes for one, we break critical functionality for the other. So this in my head, I now start drilling down into the checklists. 
system functionality tested, defect levels acceptable. As the conversation continues, we keep drilling down, eventually get to the root cause, and we get to an agreed to solution. What I want you to take from this it is, is that it is just a conversation using natural words that can help guide a team to an effective solution. In conclusion, I stated in the beginning of this presentation that there are many possible uses of essence. Using it as a critical thinking tool is an exciting, timely, and practical way to help prepare our next generation of software professionals for the challenges they are certain to face. If you're interested in more information on this subject, refer to my website, www.essence-in-use.com for references to related blogs, books, and my training course. Thank you.